Hello and welcome back to Division One Rejects. And I, this, I'm your host, Kobe Manzo. I'm so excited to get started tonight. And I would just say we are so back. We are absolutely back. Tonight's episode, we're going on an hour and probably close to an hour and a half tonight's episode. This is going to be full of incredible football talk across all three divisions. Genuinely, this might be one of the best episodes we've put out in the history of the show. Tonight is 174. There's 173 other of these floating out on YouTube and other platforms, which you should tune into all of them, by the way. But this one, if you're here for one, this one is going to be a fantastic one. I'm joined by two great guests and then two insiders from D1 Rejects. To start things off, we have the quarterback from Pittsburgh State, Chad Dodson. He and the Gorillas at Pitt State just played and won against Ferris State in front of 10,000 people down in Pittsburgh, Kansas, and what was probably the highlight of Week Zero at the Division II level. Then we've got Jackson Dooley, the quarterback from Benedictine College, excuse me, who just came off a massive win and stunned number 10 Morningside in the NAIA scene on the road, 48-45 with a goal line stand to finish things off. Just some absolutely incredible games this weekend. We're here to cover all of it. I will cover a lot of the D2 side of things. Jimmy Martin is back on the D3 side. We preview four or five of the best D3 matchups for the coming week one of D3 football. Matt Schwarzler is back on the podcast. We're so excited to have him back. We recap a lot of the week one for NAI and preview some good stuff coming up for week two. If you can't tell, I haven't even gotten a breath in. Like, I'm so excited for the night. I genuinely am so appreciative to be back here talking football and appreciative that you, whoever you are, are back here to listen to it. Uh, this is something that I'm just, we have so many more great ideas for this season, and I'm pumped to bring you guys along the way for it. But like I said, D2, Week Zero Recap. We got big time NAIA games to recap and preview, and then we go through and break down all the best D3 matchups for the coming weekend. Per usual, timestamps, video chapters, bottom of the screen if you're watching on YouTube. If not, if you're listening, check the description right there. You'll find the timestamps in the video chapters. You can fast forward to any part of the show that sounds interesting to you. And maybe we'll talk about your team or your buddy's team, your brother, your cousin, your dog's uncle. Who knows what it is? But once again, D1R 174, thank you for tuning in. Let's get right into the conversation and quit chatting. Let's go right to Chad Dodson from Pittsburgh State. <laughs> Join the show tonight, the man under center this weekend for the Pitt State Gorillas in front of 10,000 people in what is referred to as the jungle slayer of bulldogs, Chad Dodson. Appreciate you having me. <laughs> Good to have you on here, my man. I, I told you before we got going, it felt like uh, I could have had you on at any point throughout the, the last season or two, and for some reason I just haven't reached out and made this happen. I don't know why and what made me not do that, but I'm glad to have you here now because what better time to talk about the Gorillas than right now and the win that you guys are coming off of. Yes, sir. Such a such an awesome piece, man. And really, just to build off that, what a freaking environment. That number 10,000, did it feel like 20? Oh, it felt it felt insane. I mean, <laughs> from the time we, we – so for our gorilla walk, we walk out of our indoor facility. Oh yeah, and it's, it's a, a just a stretch down a path, and um, from the time we walked out, I was standing next to Jack Barkley, one of our captain linebackers, and we both looked at each other like, "This is real deal right here." <laughs> That is so neat. And we know all about the Gorilla Walk. We've talked quite about it um, on this particular show. Just because of the fact that, one, it's just a neat thing that you don't see as much at, potentially at this level of football. But two, because I've never seen an empty Gorilla Walk. Like, everyone right. shows up to the Gorilla Walk. And, and just a couple quick Google searches here. It's telling me that uh, Pittsburgh, Kansas, population of just at least the city there is about 20,000. You're telling me half the city showed up on, uh, on Saturday? Uh, this town shuts down when it's game day. It's pretty cool. I mean, the tailgates, the gorilla walk, uh, every game day here that I've been a part of, the community shows out, and uh, they did their job this Saturday. They they gave Fair State some trouble. Dude, I that I don't doubt that at all. I mean, the environment, obviously your guys' stadium is is definitely regarded as one of the best, if not the best in the country, especially when it comes to that atmosphere piece. Because uh, as some teams know, you can go out and build a hell of a stadium. If people don't have their ass in the seats – uh, it's just going to echo. I don't know exactly what happened. Something yep. like that, right? Yep. It, it's, it just looks weird. Uh, <laughs> you know, some stadiums are kind of smaller, but they fill them out and it's cool. But we're, we're fortunate to have kind of both, you know, a big stadium yeah. and, and to pack it out. So it's pretty cool. Absolutely, man. Not only was that a great way for your squad to kick off 24, I mean, stating the obvious, but how about one being the first game as head coach, Coach Anthony there, a top five opponent, these massive expectations for you guys coming into the season inside the MIAA and on the national scale, and then just the cherry on top is the uniforms, the silverback helmets, 
so much hype and just anticipation. Uh, and, and obviously you guys capitalize on it, but good Lord. I mean, that is just, that's got to be tough to navigate when there's so many different things that lead up into a game day like that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and I give credit to all our guys. You know, there was a lot of noise, a lot of hype going into this game, but uh, we're very good at tuning out all that outside noise and just sticking to what we do best. And that's going one to know every week. And uh, like you mentioned, Coach Anthony, this was his uh, his first win here as a head coach. But what a lot of people don't know is he was actually here in uh, 2020, 2021, oh, yeah. and yep. 22. So he uh, he was our defensive coordinator there and uh, just an awesome dude, a great coach. The players love him. Um, so when he made the decision or when, when he was hired as the head coach here, uh, it was a no-brainer for all the guys to come back and, and to stay here and, and to buy into what he's doing because he's an awesome coach. That's great. You don't see that again. You don't see that very often because when the, there's a change at uh, the helm there, so to speak, usually that means there's a good part of the ship that's uh, testing the waters. That might right. be one of the better right. analogies I've used on the show and its history on um, that kind of lined up pretty well. But yeah. um, I will say you guys do a good job of blocking out that noise. Whoever's running the socials like that team over there did a great job on capitalizing on kind of this national spotlight for you guys. Also, I think even through my voice into one of the edits so I, I can officially like die tomorrow and I've made it because I got thrown into Pitt State edit. I, I literally came downstairs. I showed my roommate. I was like. They put your boy in at it. Like I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> if I, as if I wasn't already ready to go, I, I was pretty pumped up. So uh, kudos go. to them for sure. Cause they have, they have definitely capitalized on the content, uh, promoting you guys in that environment, which I love, but, uh, let's talk about, you know, just the final, the score, right? When you glance at a box score, holding Ferris state to three points, something we simply have just not seen. Right, the last time I had to look, actually, last time was 2017. They were on the road at Ashland, who was uh, it was a big time contest. But the fact that hasn't happened in almost a decade tells me all I need to know about this defense. Tell me what else do I need to know about this defense and what you learned about them on Saturday? Yeah, uh, Fair State, like you, like everyone knows. I mean, they're a great program. They've had a ton of success these past few years. Obviously, going back to back national championships, uh, they're a really awesome program, a well respected program. Um, but our defense is next to none. Uh, if they're not the best defense in the country, I don't know who is. Um, and they've been like that for multiple years in a row now. Uh, and as an offense, when you go against that caliber of a defense every single day in practice uh, and, and spring ball and, you know, throughout the summer and, and into fall camp, I mean, what better, what better contest is there? I mean, we're going against the best defense day in and day out, and that just makes our offense that much better too. 100%. And I would imagine in some ways, too, it almost ups the ante and puts even more pressure on you guys to to want to go out and succeed because we know these guys on the other side of the ball, that 11 is going to go out there and do their thing every given Saturday. We need to go out there and step up and, like, do our part. Is that, I'm assuming, a lot of the sentiment? Not that you guys haven't been able to do that, but, man, that's got to light a fire under your ass. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, and, I mean, this weekend, our defense was doing such a great job. I mean, we had four turnovers, I think it was, a few, few interceptions, a few yep. fumble recoveries. We had one on a kickoff. Um, but in the second half, we, we with how well our defense was playing, we didn't have to be super aggressive on offense. We went out. We had a 15-play, nine-minute drive to yep. run the clock out. I think our defense played 43 total snaps in that whole game, which is uh, pretty crazy. So uh, we didn't score a ton of points on offense. We, we only had one touchdown in the day, but – I mean, we had a ton of plays, a ton of long drives that, that ran the clock out and uh, ultimately put, put some points on the board and uh, was able to get the job done. I think the only thing scarier than a talented defense is a talented defense, excuse me, that is fresh, right? Yep. And when they're not out there playing 80, 90 snaps or something just absolutely absurd, which sometimes you do see because when a team typically they're stacked on one side of the ball, what does that mean for the other side? Maybe they're lacking a little bit of depth or talent or other things. And, and you guys certainly are not in that boat, but when you have those guys with fresh legs that are able to go out there and make plays, I mean, you said it. And then also you run into the grindstone that is Pittsburgh state offense that is going to just hold the ball and play keep away for nine minutes. And that is something that very few offenses in the country can do. You guys are one of the select few that 
that does like you you had just you know you said it does so much for your defense but let's talk about offensively you guys a lot of big question marks uh coming into this season the one and you kind of mentioned earlier coach Wright leaves you bring in coach Anthony and yes familiar face of the program but a defensive minded coach at that so maybe something of trying to figure out how that's going to to go along you lose your two top pass catchers and obviously Devin Garrison who we've had on here but Colby Katsis as well and I certainly wouldn't go as far as to say as people quote unquote counted you out because you still were Mm -hmm. giving your respect especially in the league and on the national level but you know maybe they and we I'll put this on myself as well didn't give enough respect to the guys that remained on the roster that didn't jump ship like you said you retained a lot of really good talent was that the general feeling from the people there and was it nice to have a little bit more bulletin board material maybe than years prior (laughs) yeah I think uh I think we were a little counted out for sure. And, you know, we can use it as bulletin board material. But like I said earlier, we try and tune all that stuff out because we know what we do here every single day. Uh, we're prepared and we're ready to go every single Saturday. Good answer. Uh, like, That's the radio interview coming out. That's good answer right there. That's yeah. good stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like you said, we lost Devin Garrison, two-time All-American tight end. Um, and then Colby Katzis went with Coach Wright to Northern yep. Arizona. Um, two awesome players for us. Uh but, I mean, we bring back both of our running backs from last year, Noah Hernandez, Cleo, Cleo Chandler. We bring back a stacked room of receivers uh, that have been in the program for three, four, five, six years. Uh, and Jack Roberts, Jake Bogdan, Karan Parkman, Cam Gillespie. We bring back Christian Carter, uh, oh, yeah. who went to Memphis. Um, so bringing him back brings a ton of speed to our offense. We have some playmakers on offense. And then we bring in uh, Will Huggins, a, a KU transfer tight end, six seven, Huge pass catching tight end for us. Um, great in run blocking too. Uh, and then we have an experienced group of O linemen that have been here too. I mean, we yep. have a lot of dudes that have been in this program for a long time and gave everything they have uh, for this place. So, I mean, there was some question marks and we did lose some guys, but we have a lot of guys that have been here a long time on both That's- sides of the that's the best thing about question marks is they can be answered and they can be answered rather quickly when you go out and when you do what you guys did um, on Saturday. And obviously we're familiar with uh, with Trace Jeffries and coming out of that spot and, you know, being a, in a leadership role and kind of a captain for you guys to lose him. But again, you, you said there's a group there that's got a lot more depth than just one guy and it takes five of them to be out there at all times and you've got a great group there. You mentioned it. We're already getting the Garrison uh, comparisons, if you will. Will Huggins, he comes in. It looks like you guys just have another freak at the tight end position. How fun has it been uh, to just get him started and to see some of that potential of what he can do for this offense? Yeah, it's been awesome. Uh, From the time that he's came in, he's been fully invested in what we do. Uh, I mean, he's worked his ass off since since the time he's got here. Uh, And he's just a great player and a great dude. He cares about the team, the success of the team, and uh, yeah, I'm really fired up to see what he does this year. Oh, yeah. And you you mentioned the size. I didn't even know off the top of my head. That one-handed grab on the left sideline right there. Oh, that was nice. That was, was really sweet. nice. I kind of lost it. I was standing behind the old line. <laughs> I lost it, and I heard the crowd go crazy. I saw him get up celebrating. <laughs> That's great, dude. Um, he's got, you know, hopefully the first of, of many for him and, and for you guys. But, um, you know, to speak on, on you, I guess, a little bit more specifically, you're a guy that's been a gorilla through and through, and you've been through this program. Your bio says you're the second in school history for career passing yards, third for touchdown passes. When I check the record books, I think you're number one. Is that something you're aware of, or should I shut up and let you play football? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm second and third. Okay. Um, yeah clear in the air yeah we'll leave, we'll leave it at that we'll see what happens <laughs> that's wonderful uh just upward trajectory from here but but really though you've been a captain the last two seasons and what has this program done for you being in that leadership position and how has it helped you grow into that role yeah uh <laughs> when i first came here I, i'd never heard of pittsburgh state uh, and, and i didn't really know much about division two football as a whole um i moved 17 hours away uh as an 18 year old kid to a place I'd never been, uh, and I am so grateful for that for the whole experience. I wouldn't change a thing. Uh, I'm truly blessed to play for this university, this community, uh, the coaches, the players I've been able been able to be around in my time here has been has been really awesome. So uh, this place means everything to me. It's a home away from home for sure. They might now you might be putting it at it. They might cut that for some of their promotional material. You know that. <laughs> yeah. They might, uh, but you know the only way to finish the conversation off talking about Missouri Southern. What do you guys got to do to keep the train rolling against the Lions this weekend on the road? Yeah, I think 
I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but every single week, it doesn't matter who we play on Saturday. Um, we're going to prepare every single week like like it's a championship game because in the MIAA top to bottom, anybody can beat anybody. It's a great conference, uh, and every week is a championship game. So uh, we'll get back after it tomorrow. we got our first day of, of practice and prep tomorrow on Missouri Southern. So uh, get some stuff dialed up and, and get rolling. And as a team, too, that obviously you guys don't like – how do I say? Like I'm not – you know, you guys – expect to make the playoffs like you expect to go through and win these games and do that and it's not a cocky it's not arrogance it's a confidence in the ability that you have in that locker room does that preparation I, I would assume from my end get just jacked up another notch knowing that we have to figure out how to prepare correctly because yes obviously you're going to prepare for a Missouri Southern but you don't want to get to the playoffs and get to a Grand Valley or a Harding or a UCM whatever one of these teams and then figure out how to prepare for a playoff game and a playoff atmosphere I'd imagine that those conversations happen now and really focusing how you guys prepare and prep for these opponents yeah for sure every week is is the same preparation I mean what we do day in and day out doesn't change no matter who we play uh, whether it's Missouri Southern, whether it's Ferris State, whether it's week three, four, five of the playoffs, we're going to prepare the same exact way every week. Yeah, you need it because uh, Super Region 3 is full of like everyone's worst nightmare, um, at least for this next season until it switches up in uh, in 2025. But uh, Chad, I really appreciate you, man. Thank you for uh, for coming on here and chatting ball with me. Really excited to continue to follow along with you guys. That's uh, hopefully the first of, of many big time games for you and company down there, the Gorillas, man. Yes, sir. I appreciate you, man. Absolutely. You have a good rest of your night. You too, man. See ya. All right. We are back from talking with Chad, and we're going to close things out talking about this Ferris State-Pittsburgh State game a little bit more because it really was just a game of that magnitude that deserves to be talked about at this fashion. And again, Ferris State, which, by the way, unveiling the new unis right there, the new blacks, the black sleeves, pretty good look. We saw a lot of Trinidad uh, right here, the quarterback that was in for Ferris State, looked a little bit shaken up on a couple of those rollouts. You noticed, if you watch the film here, both of his picks were on rollouts. So I don't know if it's part of their game that maybe they have to work on a little bit more. Uh, something that we have seen a good bit out of uh, Ferris State, excuse me. They like to spread the ball out and get the ball in the hands of their playmakers. Usually, that comes a lot of times. You see Garson Golker, the other part of that two-quarterback tandem. He had a little bit of a uncharacteristic rough day as well. You see the forced fumble there recovered by the Gorillas, which was a turning point in this game down in Carney Smith Stadium. But usually we see that in the form of some quick screen passes and other things from Ferris State to get on the outside and get their playmakers in space. Felt like they got a little bit away from their game plan. Definitely not as many snaps or carries from Carson Golker as I was expecting in this one. You expect Ferris to dominate the line of scrimmage, but against a defense like Pittsburgh State, they simply were unable to. Here's the second of the two interceptions. What a toe tap grab there on the sideline to get the ball back in the hands of the Gorillas. And I mean, this game was incredible. This uh, Thoroughly, this game, it, it just reminds me a little bit of, you know, and again, it's a, it's a different Gliac squad, but remember last year we opened up with Grand Valley State playing Colorado School of Mines, two of the best teams in the country, and they set the bar so unbelievably high for D2 football. This game has done that and probably then some. Like the, I think this has piqued so many people's interest for D2 football, and I love the fact that we have the week zero to have these opportunities to go and do that stuff. I think it's going to, you know, this level of football, and especially this early in the season, you're only going to get more and more people to tune in to the great product that is D2 football. But the Gorillas take it 19 to 3 and when you break down the stats on this one, and like I kind of alluded to it earlier, um, Carson Golker only had one pass attempt. That one was incomplete. He only had eight carries on the ground, and they stuffed him in 31 net yardage on the day for a quarterback and a guy who we've seen break records running the ball for the Bulldogs there and who is a very potent runner. Uh, Trinidad Chambliss, he was 13 for 20, 133, two interceptions. Uh, both of them were sacked twice behind the line of scrimmage. And again, I, this is not a knock on Ferris State. We know they're going to be an incredible team going down the line. This is a look how good Pittsburgh State can potentially be. This is like, look how good and dangerous this Gorilla Squad is. I think that's the highlight in what you see from that. And it's not like they dominated the ground game either. They didn't have a rusher over 50 yards. The passing game was not, you know, anything too crazy. Dodson, we talked to, 22 for 33, 206 yards and an interception. Nothing incredibly flashy. Some good numbers for sure. He spread the ball out. There were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 different Gorillas that caught passes in this one. You love to see that. Some great depth at those positions. And he talked about some of those guys that are their big pass catchers coming back. But defensively, 
Pittsburgh State showed up, showed out. I'll leave it at that. We're going to talk a lot more about both those squads moving on, but uh, that game was certainly one for the books. Let's move over and talk about another GLIAC squad, this time, though, matching up with an NSIC foe, Michigan Tech. They make the trip down to number 25. Uh, by the way, all the rankings I use here are based off the AFCA. Sometimes I go back and forth with D2Football.com and AFCA, but um, the rankings today I'll use from the AFCA, and I'll let you know that ahead of time. But uh, Michigan Tech, they traveled down to number 25, Bemidji State in Minnesota. And this game, for those of you uh, who did not tune in, first of all, I apologize because uh, – you know, this one was a very fun game to watch. The Beavers end up taking this one, but they couldn't do it in regulation. They needed a little bit of extra time. They take it 19-13 to 13 in OT down at Chet Anderson Stadium. And uh, this one was just entertaining all around. You see Freeze getting out of the pocket and scrambling there. He did quite a bit of that over the course of this one. But that's not to say Michigan Tech's offense struggled because you look at Freeze's final stat line, 28 for 43 with 261 and a touchdown. No turnover through the air for Michigan Tech either. And, and something that jumps off the page for me right away, 43 pass attempts from a Michigan Tech offense that we just have not seen that from. So maybe developing a little bit new of a new identity there for the Huskies, especially on the road to see that. Um, quite a few carries on the day, but uh, a lot of those unfortunately were behind the line of scrimmage freeze sacked three times. That defensive line from Bemidji State with returning the likes of guys like Mark and ha Marcus Hansen, excuse me, the reigning defensive player of the year in the Northern Sun, uh, you see one of those plays right here, bringing them down the line of scrimmage. That defensive line from Bemidji State, I would put it right up there. The best in the conference for them. One of the best in the country. If they continue at this clip, we saw glimpses of that last year, and it certainly seems that they're picking up right on pace this year. Bemidji State also getting it done through the air. We talked about them losing their quarterback, their signal caller, and Brandon Alt from last year, who was quite the stud on offense. That was the overtime winner for the Beavers. They pick up the win at home. What a statement win for that Bemidji squad. Take a look at it from another angle. Drops it in the breadbasket. Back left corner of the end zone, and that would do it. We got it from three angles. How about that? How about that? Great ball placement, great catch. Bemidji State picks up the W. And, uh, you know, again, still a lot of times where this is not a, a rip on Michigan Tech. Michigan Tech played a really quality game. Their offense obviously came up short at a few points, and, and we talked about it. We knew the defenses for both these teams were going to be more of the focal point heading into the season, especially early on, right? We're in week zero. The offenses are still trying to figure things out. But, you know, I think there were really bright points for Michigan Tech's offense, and we didn't really know. There were some question marks uh, around who was going to have that production. Having Darius Willis back, he still he got his, you know what I mean, over 100 yards on the day for the receiver there for the Huskies. But it, there's still a lot of things to fix. Obviously, for the Huskies, you didn't come away with a win. There's a lot of things to be proud of for that Michigan Tech squad to go in there and put up a really good game at Bemidji State. Bemidji, though, that's a big-time win for them to start the year off in the non-conference slate and uh, get ready for some really big-time Northern Sun competition. Now, they were actually not the only Northern Sun team to go out and have some great success. This team, though, I, I would definitely argue one in the more emphatic fashion and on the road Nothing less. Uh, I'm talking about Minnesota State, Mankato. The Mavericks go down to Northwest Missouri State. And, and to paint the scene for you, we talked about it in last week's episode. The Bearcats from Northwest Missouri State were 123-12 and 12 at home since 2012, I believe it was. That number is somewhere around there. All that to say, they have been dominant at home the last almost uh, over a decade. Right, so Minnesota State will play the will play the highlights here. Minnesota State goes down into town to take on the Bearcats. Mankato slated at number thirteenth in the country. The Bearcats number twenty two, respectively. Mankato comes in there. Not only did they come out and play well, here's Eckern to under center for Mankato and the Mavericks. They came out and dominated in the first half. And they did it offensively and they did it defensively. They kind of did it in all three phases of the game. You see it here. They get out and score early. The tight end sneaks into the end zone. They left the Bearcats scrambling in the first half. And you want to know the number? Well, it was, let's see here, do a little bit of math, 22 to zip. After the first half, the Mavericks were up. Now, Northwest, their offense would find a little bit of its stride in the second half. This one, the final 36-22, to Mankato with a big-time win down in Bearcat Stadium there. And when you kind of break down the stats, Hayden Eckern was 18 for 25, 205 yards and a tud. Did have a pick on the day. Um, and how about another face at quarterback for the Bearcats in, in uh, Chris Runke, excuse me. We had Mike Hohensee on the program a couple times. Got a tryout with the Dallas Cowboys. Really like Mike. 
There's Chris doing his thing, throwing a dot into the end zone for one of their scores in the day. Good to see him and good to see that Northwest offense start to find their identity with a new guy under center for the Bearcats. He had a great day. 15 for 24, 268 and three tuds for him. Now, Northwest, though, where they really struggled was on the ground. Their uh, running back, starting running back there in, uh, uh, in Braden, I, was, I believe is, is his name, a net 13 yards on eight carries, and then Runke was sacked a few times. He finished with a net of negative 32 yards on the day. So Mankato, the NSIC apparently comes out and has some really quality defensive line play, and that front seven for both Bemidji and Mankato showed out in both of these contests. But uh, you look through defensively, and there's a couple of guys that jump off the page. Cody Brown, who uh, I guess I, I don't, that's a pretty good segue to pull up our uh, – Players of the Week selections. I can go through those from Division Two. Cody Brown was our Defensive Player of the Week selection when it comes to Division Two between us and the College Football Network. Let's see if I can find that real quick. Here he is for you guys. You see the stat line right there. Seven tackles, three of them behind the line of scrimmage, two of those sacks, big-time playmakers for the big-time defensive linemen for the Mavericks. Love to see that if you're a Mankato fan. You got on the list our special teams player of the week coming from that same game and Cole Lamel. How about four punts with an average of almost 52 yards? He had one that went 64? Hello, have a day, kid, over there punting the ball. Um, I will say... When your punter's having a great game, it usually is not the best indicator for your offense. That certainly seems to hold true here for Northwest in this particular instance. But uh, nonetheless, very, 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 I cannot stress this enough, big time win for Mankato to go on the road and have that result in what is, I know, a very hostile environment in front of almost 5,000 people down there in Missouri. So... Exciting stuff. Very good stuff for uh, Mankato. I'm running out of breath because I'm so excited talking about this stuff, guys. But uh, we'll close things off. The Black College Football Hall of Fame Classic in Canton Hall of Fame Stadium. We had Virginia State versus Benedict. And I will not be able to show the clips from this, you guys, because I believe that one was broadcast um, somewhere that has the rights to it. So I don't want to go ahead and take that and then get that taken down. But Virginia State comes out. Benedict is a team that has obviously gotten their flowers and, and rightfully so the last couple of seasons. We know it's a defense that has been very staunch defensively in that front seven and has done a really good job in conference. But Virginia State comes in 23-7, to and they really did dominate a win over Benedict. Um, it was the, like I said, the Black College Football Hall of Fame Classic at Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium in Canton. And uh, Benedict actually took the lead early, which is uh, a little bit surprising. But then Virginia State just started to roll. They were... Uh, they outgained Benedict 384 yards to 233 in total yardage. Uh, their running back, uh, Jamil Williams, led the way. He had 23 carries for 150 yards, two touchdowns. He was the game's uh, offensive MVP. A little bit of a delay in the third quarter, some lightning and things, but uh, the Trojans did not miss a beat. They kept going there, and uh, they seem to have some really promising stuff going forward. Between Virginia State and Virginia Union, who uh, we're not going to talk about too much, but they had a big-time W uh, this week as well. The Virginia D2 football scene, Seems to be in pretty good hands. I'll go through and mention just some other names maybe that are worth mentioning. How about Carson Newman in their first game under new head coach over there? 50-7 to win over Reinhardt running the triple option. They bring over the guy, I'm blanking on his name right now, from I believe Navy. Central State put up a pretty good fight against FCS opponent Moorhead State. We had uh, East Stroudsburg take the win, the PSAC victory over Edinburgh. Fairmont State looked pretty solid. Delta State with a big-time win, 47-16 over Mars Hill. That was one that we had talked about last week and previewed. Going down the list, Missouri Western comes up win uh, comes up with a win in a close one versus uh, Northeastern State in MIAA matchup. Sol Ross falls short in their first D2 matchup against West Texas A&M. Keep going down the list here. You've got a Nebraska Kearney with a win over Shadron State, 18-6. And then it looks like CSU Pueblo was also one that uh, looked really, really good. Reggie Retzlaff, the receiver over there. 35-6 to over South Dakota Mines. He had himself quite the day. Uh, the Thunder Wolves looked very, very good, very dangerous. So excited to see them play Grand Valley here very shortly. That's going to be a, a good one, I believe. Not this coming week, but the week after. And then finally, Mesa takes a big win over Kingsville. But that's kind of the D2 stuff for today. I won't waste any more of your time. I want to get right into the next guest conversation with Jackson Dooley from Benedictine. <laughs> Joining the show tonight, he's the field general for the Ravens offense at Benedictine College. Who's coming off a massive, I repeat, massive win over the number 10 team in the country on the road. Jackson Dooley, what's up, man? Nothing much. How are you? 
Dude, excited to get you on here. It's been a minute since we talked to uh, a representative from the Ravens over there. Uh, but after the game this week, I don't know if there was a better team or a better uh, person, I guess, in more particular, to talk to after this week's events, man. It, that that game was ridiculous. Yeah, it was it was pretty crazy. You know, getting that lead early, our defense pick six first drive. I mean, I didn't even see it. I was trying to warm up. <laughs> trying to stay loose, you know, first game. And the next thing you know, we're up 7-0. So that's always a good start. That is great. And like 48-45 in my head, like if you pitch that number to someone, um, you know, college football is probably not the first that comes to mind. I probably go to like JV boys basketball or like some, maybe even like a varsity game, somewhere along those lines. Yeah. The just magnitude of scoring that happened and how back and forth it really was, right? You guys obviously had an early lead and we'll talk about that. Did it feel like as much of a whirlwind, whirlwind, excuse me, as the box score kind of made it out to be? Is it just like that back and forth kind of slugfest all night? It felt like it was definitely a game of runs, which college football tends to be. You know, we got up early, scored a bunch, and then we didn't score for a while. Yeah. And then they scored a ton. And the next thing you know, we're losing with four minutes left. And you, you, you got to go win the game. So oh, yeah. It, it, it went fast. It went fast for sure. End of the first quarter, you guys are up 21-3. Again, just the stakes being set, this Morningside squad that has been a national contention team the last couple of years and even, you know, even prior to that, you guys obviously don't put the, what's the expression, don't put the carriage in front of the horse, whatever the hell it is, but uh, the confidence level on that sideline had to be pretty high at that point. Yeah, no, you go into every game knowing you can win, but there's also that sense of when you, when you have a start like that, that you could get complacent and which we didn't like to see him like that it was almost seemed like you're playing not to lose and to win yep. and that is when a team like Morningside who's probably one of the best NAI teams or programs of all time when they can come back and and get you which they did we're just glad that uh we got out with the win yeah no, I, I don't blame you there, and I want to talk about that composure a little bit because at the half, 28-17, but then fast forward to the fourth, right? Morningside, they take their first lead of the game all the way in the fourth quarter, and kind of my notes here, like, it's one thing to respond the way that you guys did to go and rally and bounce back immediately like that in week six or week nine or somewhere down the season where you've had these guys together and you face some adversity along the way, but when this is your opening matchup, there, there's nothing besides preseason camp to, to go and prepare for these kind of things. So I think, like, for literally week zero to be able to go out there and have that level of composure, and that's, you know, you all the way down to everyone on the offense, but just the entire team in general, what do you attribute that to? Because to me, that is a really, really strong quality of, of a winning team. Yeah, we have we have a lot of very good leaders. We have we returned a lot of people. We've had guys, I mean – the group we're playing with right now, these are the people I came into school with here at yep. Benedictine. We've been together. We've lifted all summer. I think we had 150 guys with us over the summer players wow. for the the month, June and July. So, and so that's like more that. like the, the varsity and the JV? Is that why the number is so high? Yes. Yeah, so, so it's okay. incoming freshman as well. I got you. Yep, yep. Got it. Yep. So working out, grinding, living together, working together. That's awesome. Paying bills. Uh, <laughs> so Testing to that, I think, is where that that comes from. And just the, the brotherhood we have. I honestly think we're probably – like, I, there isn't a guy on the team that I don't know or hang out with. I mean, it's an every weekend, every day. These are the guys I want to spend the most time with. So, I think that also – Yeah. That helps a lot. No, that's incredible. And then just to stay on that same line of thought, the touchdown to Gathright, that's a guy that you come in with, what, four years ago now – there's been a lot of that connection over the last couple of years, potentially none as big as the one that just occurred. But uh, talk about your relationship with him and having the trust for him to go make a play like that. Yeah, you know, Jacob's one of my one of my guys, one of my best friends. You know, when I got to school here, San Diego, Lawrence, Kansas, you're not – who knows how well you'll get along. Yeah. But uh, we hit it off pretty well. You know, finally got the opportunity to play with him last year. He's been playing since his freshman year. And it was awesome. And I knew on that drive before on fourth down, he didn't come down with it. And I, I knew first play, I was like, this is going to Jacob. He's not going to drop two in a row. And, you know, the O-line, great all night, zero sacks. Again, I don't think uh, – kept me clean, gave me time, threw it up there. He made a great play. 
I love that, dude. He did. Like, that's it's a very nice way of saying it. It was more than that. Um, from both ends, by the way, you got to deliver the ball and put it in a spot. Um, but, you know, you guys go do your job on the offensive end. But at the end of the day, even after scoring 48, the whole thing comes down to the defense. Because Morningside, for those who didn't watch the game, they get that opportunity. They go down. They're right on, like, the one-yard line. And they have this chance to either kick and tie or – Go for it. And typically when you're at home, you see someone, you know, go for the tie and play in that overtime because you're in that home environment. They said, screw that, throw it out the window. We want to try and finish this thing right now. Never a doubt, right on the sideline? Never a doubt. Never a doubt. I had one of my boys, uh, Ethan, he was just yelling, you got to believe the whole time. <laughs> yes. Making sure everyone knew. So I was like, all right. All right, I got trust in a big old 3-6, Zach Lacombe. Yes. Uh, redshirt freshman, sophomore linebacker, stuffed him. Everyone else pushed that pile back. Isaac Anderson, I mean, it was a great – it was awesome play. What a game by Zach, too. I mean, if we're just throwing names out there, that was uh, quite of a coming-on-the-scene performance. You said redshirt freshman, correct? Redshirt freshman or sophomore, I don't I, – uh, Yeah, I'm one not. of the two, but either way, I mean, just to come out – I don't care if he was a, a sixth year. Like, the performance he had was, was fantastic. And the video that was great that was going on social media from your coach was the freshman watching the reaction from the dorms. Did you – were you able to see that? Oh, man, so cool. So cool. Some of those guys, I mean, setting up the TV and then getting getting them all in there. I mean, it looked like it was probably 100 people in there watching that game. Yeah. Pretty, cool. pretty cool to see. Dude, that is incredible. Like, the atmosphere. You talk about, like, everyone loves to preach family, right, and, like, the friendships, and you touched on it earlier. But then you see videos like that, and, and that's proof, right? The energy in that building, that is exactly proof of what you just talked about, right? No, for sure. And it even today, we had a JV game. We played uh, Ottawa at four. Okay. The whole team's on the sideline watching. I mean, at the end of the half, we had one of the freshmen pick up a fumble and return it 100 yards. I mean, the whole sideline is going nuts. It's just that type of uh, brotherhood we have and that type of culture we've built here at uh, BC. Hell yeah, man. Not everyone has that. I love that, uh, I love that you guys do. Um, but, I mean, that's going to be a game that you guys remember. Now, with that being said, you know, you guys had a tight one versus Morningside last year. Also decided by three points, a last-minute score. Probably felt a little bit like deja vu. This, uh, this one, I imagine, feels a lot better on the, uh, on the back end looking back. Yeah, no, for sure. Anytime you can, uh, you can go on the road and beat, beat a, it, it, go on the road and beat anybody, it feels good. But coming back, beating them after they beat us last year, that poor taste in our mouth probably even kept us out of the playoffs at the end of the year. Yep. Coming back here and being able to just just get one back, it feels really good. Oh, I believe that. That was uh, that was probably the most laid up question I'll, I'll, I'll give you. But um, what are you most proud of about this squad coming out of the win, looking back at it, having a chance to go back and watch some of the film and relive some of those moments? Because, like you said, there are some things when you're so focused in on doing your job and doing like your one eleventh, so to speak, that you miss out on, on some other pretty big parts of the game. The interception, like you had said earlier, maybe being one of those. Now being able to look back at the game retrospectively, what are you most proud of uh, of this team coming out of this win? Uh, we'll we'll go uh, we'll go all sides ball offense our run game. I mean last year they outrushed us a ton and that was the focus for us to go out. And I mean it was everyone, even the receivers. I mean we had some big blocks from our receivers on the on the some big runs. I think we rushed for over almost 250 yards. Yeah, include with two of our backs, even uh, Jay Sean Todd, which receiver back guy getting into it, and then the O line just mauling people as as they like to do. And then on defense, just their ability to stay together and just continue to try to get the ball back to us, turn the ball over, getting it to us. And then uh, Harry Balky, our kicker, knocking one through, you know. He missed that one that he'll want to have back. Yep. And then he they didn't always look pretty, but when you win by three and you make two field goals <laughs> – it's a pretty good job by that guy. No, that's that's very big. And some teams, you know, coming off a win like this, you again on the road, national opponent, and you just barely get over that hill, and you and you pass. You know what the team last year was able to do. Coming off a you know probably what is an emotional win for you guys like that, a lot of teams might struggle to lock it back in and and square up against an opponent next week that maybe isn't morning side. How are you going to handle that and make sure the guys are dialed in and focused? Well, with the way. Uh... The NAI and the heart works is you can't you can't slip up any games. Every game's a big game. We got a gauntlet of a schedule coming up. We got Penn this week, which is big. They're looking yep. a lot better. Had a big win last week. We uh, we we struggled offensively against them last year. Our defense played great. Snuck out of there. So this is it's a big game for us on offense. Then we got Grandview at home, and then oh, St. Yeah. Ambrose 
road, Baker at home. I mean, we got to, we, we got to be able to just build on each win instead of using this as the, this is just the floor that we can build onto. Yeah. And that's what's going to be my last piece for you too, is that not to say the second half is a cakewalk by any means, like you said, you can't, uh, you know, give up any weeks in that conference in the hard conference, but your schedule this year, pretty front loaded. I mean, you just went down the list, right? You talk about a, a William Penn team that is uh, seemingly much improved. Then you go down some names like Grandview and Baker right there in the coming weeks in a, in a St. Ambrose squad that's got some question marks around it. You don't know exactly what you're getting from them yet. You guys like it that way, huh? Just give it your best shot right off the rip. Hey, I mean, we, we get the schedule at the beginning. We're ready to <laughs> play. It doesn't matter when, when and where. We'll, we'll be ready to go. Good answer. Good answer, brother. Well, that's all I got for you tonight, Jackson. I appreciate you coming on, man, and uh, really yeah. excited to continue to follow you guys. It's been uh, a fun squad to, to tune in and watch, and I only imagine it's going to continue, man. Awesome, awesome. Appreciate everything you do. Your of coverage of the lower levels. Pretty cool. Absolutely. I appreciate you, man. Have a good rest of your night. Cheers. All right, let's flip over to the D3 side. Joining us tonight, back making an appearance on the show, Jimmy Martin <laughs> is back with us. Good to see you, fella. Good to see you too, Kobe. It's uh, it's always great to be on the show. It's been a little while, and it's nice because we did a few shows in like summer, and it's like, yeah, those are fun. But now it's like football time, so we're always happy about that. Yes, it is, dude. I, I was telling, uh, I don't know, later in the episode, I'll talk about with Matt Schwarzler, and like you only see so many like who has the best uniform, who has the best stadium post before we need to like talk about actual football. Um, we're finally yeah. to that point now. D three, a little bit behind the pack. Uh, NAI has got things started. Uh, it's obviously D two has their week zero that's going on now. The first year of that being implemented, we've already seen some outstanding football. We've got some really good games coming up on the D three slate this weekend, though, and I think uh, we picked one of the best to talk about first. Number eight Johns Hopkins at number 20 Ithaca College talk to me about this one man you know so obviously we talk a lot about uh these kind of teams big time ranked matchups in week one we kind of had to go with one of these um obviously two playoff perennial like perennial playoff contenders in Ithaca and Johns Hopkins uh I think it's kind of interesting I was looking at the spreads for this game because it always interests me like what like the experts think you know I don't say experts disrespectfully or anything like that either I just totally and uh, they have Johns Hopkins as a pretty sizable favorite in this game. And it made me kind of think, I was like, oh, didn't Ithaca, like, beat Cortland last year? Was I, am I mistaken by that? Like, I was really surprised to see that Ithaca was such a big underdog. And actually, in this one, I'm probably leaning towards Ithaca a little bit just because, you know, they're, they're a really tough team. They give they gave Cortland a hell of a game last year. And uh, Cortland's obviously national champions. So, I mean, that's a huge... Yep. Huge, huge deal. So, I mean, I, I think it's going to be a close game. I think it's come to uh, sneak one out. Yeah, you look at the offensive production here. We got some kind of stats from last season to break down. And uh, Johns Hopkins was one that was blowing teams out of the water consistently. You look at almost 41 points per game. So, obviously, you bring back a good amount of that production this year for the Blue Jays. And that's something to very much be excited about when you're converting at over 50% on a third down clip. Their red zone to touchdown ratio last year, Jimmy, out of 59 trips, 45 of them ended with one of them in the end zone. You love to see that. Now, I think a one big piece that Ithaca has going for him when you look at going on this list here 25 takeaways last year for the Bombers and that is uh that's a really big deal especially in a game like this where uh one possession can certainly determine the outcome of this one if they can manufacture a forced fumble and interception especially early and try and get the upper hand on this um, especially at home you know in that kind of environment that's something to look for I think if Ithaca has uh, two turnovers, they generate two takeaways, they win this game. I think that's going to be my stat going into it. I, I don't know about, you know, over-under-wise and some of those things, but I, I'll tell you right now, two turnovers for the Bombers, not easy to do, but two turnovers for the Bombers, they generate those, and they win this football game, and that would be a hell of a way to start the year. With that being said, I'm sure they're giving all the respect in the world right now to that Johns Hopkins squad because they deserve it. I mean, they were a one seed heading into the playoffs last year, correct? Absolutely, no, yeah, and Johns Hopkins is a great program as well. Uh, it's that interesting. You talk about how good their offense was last year, and it was it was a pretty low scoring affair last year, and because uh, they, they played in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins last year, twenty seven seventeen. And based on what you were telling me, I scored forty five touchdowns, fifty nine appearances. I wouldn't be surprised if twenty seven was the lowest amount of points they scored last year in a game. Yeah. I'd have to look, but that would not surprise me just based on how many touchdowns you told me they scored, and they, that would leave them with probably three and two field goals. I would assume in that game. But um, that leaves 42 other touchdowns in, what, like 13 games? So, like, I don't know. 
I think- and worth worth noting, last year they uh, they beat Ithaca in the opener at home, twenty seven seventeen, and what was uh, a really good matchup to start the year. Had a couple other games that was pretty close, but did uh, end up running the score up on a on a couple squads. But that goes even into the into the tournament, though. I mean, Western Connecticut in that first round they score sixty two, and then against a quality Union squad, thirty nine, and uh, they eventually lost to Randolph Macon. It was not because of a lack of offensive firepower, though. They still put up thirty six in that game, and uh, I, I definitely would expect them to be you know whatever the over is I, I would certainly certainly look into it right you know what's funny Th- this was actually the lowest over under i believe on our sheet here okay. if i think i might stand corrected but if i remember correctly it was like like 53 and a half yep 53 and a half yeah and it was 44 last year so okay. they're bumping up the over a little the over under a little bit but uh you know i could see this one being like i think my what was my prediction on there 24 21 i think yeah. It was, and again, uh, it could, I think it was it 20, like, 20 something, 17, 24, 17 or 27, 17. I just closed it out. Sorry. Yeah. That was the, uh, the game last year. I think this year. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. But, that was uh, your pick. 24, 21. You're taking game, the bombers. I could see this one being like 31, 28 too. You know, I could definitely see a game something like that. I think it'll be within a field goal or a touchdown for sure. I hear you there. We can uh, we can move on to our next game then and talk a little bit about number nine Wheaton heading over to a Wyack foe, that being UW Oshkosh. And the last meeting, I'm sure you'll talk about it in week two of 2023, Wheaton uh, got the better of them in Wheaton. So this one is definitely going to be an exciting one. Talk to me about what you're looking forward to ahead of this contest. Yeah, obviously I see like Wheaton bringing in two preseason All-Americans, Giovanni Weeks and uh, Max Wilson, I said that correctly. I think uh, I had my note sheet up here actually, and my computer died as I was uh, starting. With it. So I'm going straight from memory here. I think I had it right. Forgive me if I'm wrong. I got you. But um, yeah, no, we- Whedon's gonna have a really good team this year. The Thunder are gonna stick to their stick to their guns and just pound that rock with Giovanni Weeks. I mean, the kid's a stud. Um, Oshkosh is losing quite a lot offensively. Uh, they have a couple new coaches as well. Obviously, losing Berghammer is always tough. Um, also. Fun little tidbit for the show. Kobe Berghammer is now a stout blue devil. He's the uh, tight ends coach for us. So we're really really happy to have him. Uh, We had a couple funny little stories in camp. Uh, He introduced himself to the team. He's like, oh, okay, guys, I'm Coach Berghammer. Ooh, like the whole team, like, (laughs) met him up. It's so funny because he he got the best of us quite a few times here. But now we're all, we're all, we like him. We like him now. He's one of us. So we're happy to have him. Absolutely. Now, obviously, he's a big loss. I mean, he's a guy that uh, yeah. obviously is a quarterback and a part of your team and it was big in the pass game, big in the run game as well for them, like an incredibly athletic, dual threat, really, really dual threat kind of guy. I do believe they lost one of their top pass catchers and Tony Stagger, I believe, is also gone as well for that Oshkosh offense. So it's kind of excited and anticipating and kind of see they replace that production. Otherwise, though, I don't know if there's a, a bunch of stuff that jumps off the page about this matchup, other than the fact that they're just two really good football teams, two offenses that have done a lot of damage in the past you look at uh, some of these numbers again uh, the defense though for Oshkosh last year is, is probably where they folded a little bit almost 370 yards allowed per game and that's not a number that they're looking to to have this year but um, you know this is definitely something where the WIAC gets all this love and rightfully so this is going to be a great test for what should be a middle to upper tier team in the WIAC conference to see how they stack up against what we know is going to be a very quality out of conference opponent so not to say the the whole fate of the WIAC rests on the, on the uh, end, end result of this game, but uh, it would be a really good measuring stick for what we know is really the best conference in D3 football. Yeah, and obviously, you know, Wheaton is probably the second best team in the CCIW. Yeah. And where the Oshkosh is mid, more like middle of the pack. Um, you know, I think when it comes down to like CCIW, WIAC, it just comes down to depth at the end of the day. But um, yeah. no, definitely, it's definitely a uh, – Kind of like one of those things that's where it's SEC big time challenge or whatever. It's like kind of like that, like YX, CCIW. Like, let's see who's top dog. Like, I totally feel that. But, uh, you know, in this one, it's kind of interesting, you know, because I was like, oh, I got a YX bias. But honestly, I think Wheaton wins this game pretty convincingly. Okay. Uh, and that's not, and again, that's not me saying Oshkosh isn't a good football team. It's just I'm a big believer in the Wheaton Thunder, if I'm being honest with you. I think they're going to have a really good year. No, I like that a lot. We can uh, continue to go down the list then and talk about. Uh, John Carroll, number 19, going to UW-Whitewater, who currently sits at number two in the rankings. This was quite the opener last year. Do we expect it to live up to the hype once again? Uh, I think – I do not believe it will be as close of a game this year. Okay. Um, I think Whitewater's bringing a ton back. You know, Tamir Thomas coming back is huge for them. 
Um, you know, and also being at Perkins Stadium gets a little bit different. I and mean, then yeah. again, John Hopkins could come in there and like shock the world. I'm not saying they couldn't, but I was looking over at the spreads. They're calling this one a 23 and a half point favorite towards Whitewater. And uh, that's wild. And that, you know, these analytics are typically pretty accurate and like they're not always perfect. You know, obviously, um, there is always a human element to a lot of football games, of course, as we know. But, um, yeah, I think Whitewater might be a little too much for him. But, again, last year I probably said the same thing on the show, and they did they come down to the wire. So it was, what, 27-23 last year, I believe, at John Carroll? Yep. Uh, they scored, like, a last-minute touchdown. What was that? Nick Wind, I believe, if I remember correctly. Um, going straight from memory there. But, uh, no, yeah, there's a big sweet, like, catch back in the end zone, like, to seal the game. It was pretty, pretty awesome for the Warhawks there. But, uh, yeah, I think at home I think it'll be – like like a 35 17 kind of game i think they'll cover the spread okay. to be honest, I, think 20, I think 23 and a half is a lot of points to cover yeah. but uh i think whitewater wins this one by like two scores maybe three but not 23 and a half i think i think john carroll covers that spread no i think i think that's a fair fair kind of assumption i think for john carroll it's going to be can you stop the runs right football is the game of of runs and if whitewater goes on a really long one things could get ugly very quickly can you stimmy that defensively can you stop them and kind of slow some of that uh progression if they're able to do that and not let them have these real drawn out possessions and bust these big open plays and and kind of contain them i guess offensively so to say uh we'll see what happens there but when you look at this team these teams from 2023 and their stat comparisons like head to head there's a lot of similarity there and i think one thing that whitewater is able to do better just looking at the list that i compiled here is is generate some more takeaways and if they can do that and keep the ball especially in a home venue and one that is so uh favored with with them and that environment obviously gets real rowdy there um this could be something where uh, if Johns Hopkins mishandles just a, a few key plays, I think this could be busted open and uh, get pretty ugly quickly. But with that being said, you contain them. You see me some of that progression, some of that momentum, and and this could be, certainly be a game heading into the second half, heading into the fourth quarter. But I'm with you. I, I definitely would take Whitewater to to go and improve while they're the number two team in the country right now. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know, kind of playing devil's advocate here. I'll kind of like play a little on John Carroll's side. I think earlier, I remember how you said that the recipe for Ithaca is to get, gain some turnovers against Johns Hopkins. I think it's the same thing for John Carroll. If they come in, force a couple of turnovers early and run the ball effectively and like play like really physically, because obviously Whitewater should come in there and punch them in the mouth. Like that's just how Whitewater plays. They're going to be really physical. They're going to be tough. And John Carroll has to come in there and match that energy. And like, to be honest with you, I hope John Carroll wins. Like, I know earlier in the show, I was kind of saying, like, oh, like Whitewater's going there, crush him, like, whatever. But I mean, Heck, I, I'm I'm John Carroll's biggest fan this week. I hope <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I I'm picking them to win, but I really hope John Carroll goes in there and kicks their ass. To be honest, like bleep, there you go. But whatever, you know. <laughs> there you go. I hear uh, you there. We can uh, we can close things out then with just a little bit more, a little bit more Wyack action. We've got River Falls, a number seventeen right now, traveling to number seven Alma to kick things off. I'm excited about this one, the Scots, with a very mm-hmm. big test to open up the year. Uh, again, a lot of similarities between these two squads. You want to talk about takeaways. This Alma Scott's defense last year, who, by the way, was comprised of almost entirely all seniors across the board, so they had to replace a good bit of production there defensively. They generated 39 takeaways in their 2023 campaign. That's going to be something that uh, it did become a calling card of them throughout the season. Can you continue that production defensively? It's really hard to do. A lot of that is circumstantial but a lot of it is also scheme and they believe they've got a lot you know going down there and visiting with them they believe they have a junior class that has just been primed and ready behind this senior class to come in and take over right where they left off and you know as a coaching staff what are you supposed to say you're supposed to believe that but uh they're very high on this junior class to come in and pick up right where they left off with the scots defensively uh sorry did you say 39 39 takeaways that's impressive that is, I mean, that was that. Well, where did that rank in Division Three? That's you know? got to be, I believe, the top actually. Um, while on the other really, side of things, they only had fifteen the turnovers, which is a pretty respectable number. That's absurd. Because that's what is that? Because they played. What did they make it to the the quarterfinals last year? Yeah, that would have been. Yep, that well, would have so been quarter third, semis or something along 13, those lines. Thirteen games, so three turnovers, per, three takeaways a game. It's pretty good wow. math. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, obviously, what they, they would they lose one game or two games last year? Like, I mean, you you, you take the ball away three times, and you're not going to lose very many points. You're, you're not going to lose that many no, times because really you just because yeah. 
Because like obviously you think like, oh, great, interception, fumble, but like you're taking away a possession from our team. That's one less opportunity they can score. Like it's, it sounds so basic and obvious, but like if you really go back and look, because you only get like roughly like six possessions a game, and you've turned them over three of those six times, like you're gonna be in trouble a lot of times. So. Yeah, no, I, I'm definitely excited for this one. Over under was at 75, and uh, River <laughs> Falls, River Falls is uh, is currently sitting at least from your notes here at minus 11. So that's uh, an interesting yeah, yeah. spread to start I, things I, off, huh? Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna touch on that here as we kind of wrap it up, but uh, I was really surprised to see an 11 and a half point spread for a lower ranked team to go into the number seven team on the on road. the road on the road. So again. This is not, these are not our spreads. We're taking it from the Hanson ratings, great yep. website, great source, you know, uses stuff yep. all the time. Had him on the show. Loved, and, loved having him yeah, on here. Yeah. And it's funny because he gets a lot of crap about like, oh, these WAC teams are always heavily favored. Like, da, da, da. And, There's like, a reason. It, exactly. Yeah. And like River Falls went and beat Mary Hart and Baylor. They beat the breaks off about what, like 23 points. So it's like 45, 22, I want to say. And like, everyone was expecting Mary Hart and Baylor to win that game. You know, obviously, and like a lot, I feel like a lot of people in Division Three are thinking like, "Oh, Alma's going to win. They're higher ranked. They're at home." It's like, are you sure about that? Like, I don't know. <laughs> and you know, obviously, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take River Falls in this one. I'm gonna take I'm gonna take two out of three Wyack teams this week. I'm not gonna take all Wyack teams. It's mm-hmm. not what I'm, gonna do. I'm not gonna do that. But uh, yeah, I think River Falls wins this one. Blah, and that River Falls offense is just uh, absolutely you know, sh- being down that- there. Yeah, Being there, down there, there at Alma, eating burgers at Coach Couch's house, yeah. that might have put it over the edge for me. Yeah. But in yeah. all honesty, looking at an actual, you know, who they're bringing back on the field standpoint, it all starts with Carter St. John under center. But then you go mm-hmm. to the offensive skill. They're bringing a lot back there as well. French call on the outside is a name that I know a lot of people will be familiar with in the MIAA. Uh, this is a team that wants to go out of their way and test themselves early in the season because, let's be honest, they just haven't been getting that the last two years in the MIAA. You have maybe a, a a little bit of a close game here with Hope or Albion might give you, but we just we haven't seen much competition in conference for them. So I'm excited for them to go out and really test themselves against who they know will be a nationally ranked foe. Uh, I take them for a, a tight but a, a convincing home win here uh, to start the year off for the Scots. Either way, dude, this is going to be a really fun one to watch. Yeah, I agree. I think this is definitely the Division One Regex game of the week uh, without question. I think this is the one I was kind of putting my finger on where it's like, okay. Like, I'm going to watch this game at my house. Like, I'm going to watch this game. Because we play on Thursday, and I will have the privilege of watching football on Saturday, which is great. Because I have <laughs> I'm thinking about this. I don't remember the last time. Actually, no. We played McKendry on a Thursday night at Northern, like, two years ago. Yep. But I don't remember the last time, other than that, where I woke, in, where I woke up on a Saturday morning and just watched college game. Day. Like, I'm really excited for that. Let me tell you, as someone who's now removed from the game, it's not so bad. It's pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking about that. Yeah, like, yeah, you know, I could actually, you know, watch college game day. Don't watch game day, honest, yeah, exactly. The exactly. only college game day I watched was our game day when we did <laughs> yeah. That was, like, the only time I really was a part of one. So, yes. that was pretty sweet. Yes, and for the record, our, our game day will be back this year, whether it's week one or week nine. We're figuring that out, but uh, we will certainly be back behind the desk at some point this season. So uh, I know I'm excited. Whenever that does happen, uh, we're going to be back and we're going to be ready to go. So. I know there's a, there's a lot of people at Menominee that would love to see you do on Rejects, hit the road, come on down here. And all this is in high demand down here, for that's sure. Good. That's good. I love to hear it. But uh, yeah. that's awesome, Jim. Thank you for joining me, man. I'm excited to, to kick things off this uh, this D3 season, brother. We got a, a lot of good football ahead of us and some good stuff for you down there, too. So looking forward to following along. Absolutely, baby. Real Devils. Hell yeah. Have a good night, brother. All right. Take care. Now we can start on the NAIA side of things, and we talked with the quarterback from Benedictine earlier in Jackson Dooley. They pick up a huge road win against Morningside, 48-45. The man here to discuss it with us tonight, though, back on the show, Matt Schwarzler. What's up, man? Good to have you back. It's been a minute, dude. It's good to be talking football. We're finally here. Like, every year it's like, man football is so far away and then you blink and it's like oh it's week one <laughs> okay all right it's um, like football so the the natural progression is football is so far away and then there's like a couple hundred who has the best stadium and jersey posts yep. and like mm-hmm. random off-season content and then it's like holy shit it's week zero yeah there we go yeah totally totally parts of that really fast forward yeah. but man you want to talk about explosive high-performing football uh, Benedictine versus Morningside. Uh, Morningside, I will shamefully admit, was my preseason number one. Okay. Um, I, albeit, 
uh, much of a stretch because according to the NAIA, uh, they're 10. So that's what they're ranked. But um, <laughs> was really excited to see what they had going. And you know what? They did lose. But the quarterback position that we were very worried about kind of in the preseason, wondering what they had. They had like a dual quarterback system um, on NAIA F-ball. We got the chance to talk to Steve Ryan, uh, the head coach over there at Morningside. Um, and he, you know, said he even took blame for the dual quarterback system, how it kind of, there wasn't a lot of rhythm to it, you know, and he yep. fully admitted that. And he wants there to be one guy this year and uh, Zach, and I always butcher it. It's like a, it's like a French pron pronunciation or something. Yeah. Uh, uh, Chevalier, Chevalier or something like that, you know? Uh, so Zach, sorry for butchering your name, man. I'll have to, I'll have to look at the pronunciation guide for that one. But like, 60 attempts in the clip at quarterback. I think you're not letting somebody throw the ball 60 times. If you don't think he could sling the rock, I think they have figured out the quarterback position also worth noting Lennox Brown, who was part of that dual quarterback system last year is now playing receiver for them. Okay. Had uh 11 catches for 122 yards and two toddies to his name. Uh, oh yeah. Our buddy Zach threw for three touchdowns. I'll be at three picks, but also yes. 521 yards. And I'm playing the video to go alongside of it. One <laughs> of those picks gets taken back to the crib, but I, I think what you notice in watching and kind of cutting on the tape is that he was unfaltered. He did not, you know, mm -hmm. lose his touch, lose his confidence going through uh, some of those moments there. And I think that's important for a quarterback, especially if you're going to trust him to be, uh, quote unquote, the guy and you're not bouncing back and forth with two different people is you can go out and almost have like the Jameis Winston effect of, hey, he's going to throw three picks. But he's going to throw three <laughs> incredible touchdowns. And he's going to put up some ridiculous <laughs> numbers along the way. And if mm -hmm. they're okay with that, and they're okay with the kind of that high risk, high reward style of play, and obviously as the season goes on, you assume that he'll kind of hopefully dial that in a little bit. For sure. But I think too, like we need to give Benedictine a lot of credit. Their defense yep. like came through when they needed to. Like obviously giving up 45 points is not ideal for any defense, but the turnover game is so important on that side of the ball, being able to get three picks there. Um, and really like this, the name of the game for Benedictine was just, staying consistent um they got out to an early lead and just kept that chugging kept slowly adding points kept creeping up that scoreboard and morningside came roaring back and they they got some points and made it close very close obviously it's a three-point game but uh benedictine just stayed the course after taking that early lead and really didn't let it go for the most part mm -hmm. And really that one pick, when you look at the box score and kind of the breakdown of the scores, Morningside had the touchdown pass to Brown and then a two-yard run from Ryan Cole. Benedictine got that pick six right there on the 41-yard return. The next two scores were Morningside there. So that broke up uh, between four Morningside scores was that interception return. That you start mm -hmm. to look at, obviously, turnovers. Like, anyone will tell you turnovers are a big part of a game. That one seemingly uh, very much so in breaking up some of that scoring because of they, they could have a little bit of a slide right there defensively. Absolutely. Um, and a couple other guys from this game I think are worth mentioning. Jacob uh, Gathright from uh, oh, yeah. Benedictine with three catches for 86 yards and two touchdowns. Hey, you know, two or three of your catches are for points. That's not too bad. <laughs> Dalton Witherspoon also adding 96 yards on the ground for nine or 5.1 yards per carry. Not a bad day. Not a bad day. A lot of consistent effort around the board. A lot of guys in the backfield got touches. A lot of receivers, you know, they're spreading the ball out. It's it's efficient like you'd want it to be. Yeah. 100%, man. Let's talk about another um, exciting squad. If we're ready to close the page on that one, Montana Tech, the ore diggers, who uh, are just been mm -hmm. exciting to play. And you talk about that conference out west there in the frontier, and, and that's been one that has been – we talk about it. They cannibalize each other just about every year. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's exciting to see this ore digger team get out and get going against a non-conference foe, correct? And uh, yeah. to go and, and to do that and show some of the rest of the country what this conference does to each other week in and week out. What did you see from them? Big time 29-22 uh, win over that really highly ranked Georgetown squad. Yeah, I mean, anytime you can knock off a, the number three team in the country, man, that is a humongous win for that program. And Montana Tech has seen the top of the mountain. Like, this is a very storied NAIA program, but my God, like, that is just, that sets the tone for the rest of your season. Um a big thing to note, I think, for Georgetown that I want to talk about first, Gary Sluniker, preseason, I had a lot of discussions with people about the quarterback position for Georgetown and if the offense was going to be able to be more productive because the defense was the highlight of this team last yep. year, far and away. And they obviously had running back Darius Neal to keep most of their offense going. Problem is the passing game wasn't really there. 
uh, we're talking about it, you know, if they can even get that a little more efficient, they'll be doing, doing all right. But Gary Sluniker with uh, 10 completions on 21 attempts, 158 yards, a touchdown and four interceptions is not what you want. And to add insult to injury, Darius Neal's held under a hundred yards rushing, which I cannot remember the last time that happened. That dude is an absolute dog and ran for like, 1500 yards last year something yeah. ridiculous like that so it's uh you know it's it's tough if you're georgetown but it's also a testament to georgetown that you were able to play that sloppy it's still like be in it that close with a ranked team granted you know that's real that's really a silver lining i was gonna say wanna, i don't know how much moral I, vic, how many moral victories yeah, will be getting out of it, many... but you know it's good to, <laughs> good to mention yeah, it's good to like this isn't a team that's gonna fall off the face yeah. of the earth. This is still a very good Georgetown team, but Montana Tech taking advantage and three of those interceptions on the day coming from Jaden Downs. Jeez. Which that I mean, being able to sniff the ball out like that is impressive. There were great defensive efforts across the NAI this week, if we're being honest. So it's uh a dime a dozen with with those crazy stat lines, as we'll talk about later too, on the offensive side of the ball. But uh yeah, it was it was a fantastic win for Montana Tech. Their defense looked great. The offense was chugging. Uh, Blake Thielen was super efficient, but Land- Landers Smith uh, at running back for Tech taking the show with 200 yards and two touchdowns. Yeah, and you what go to the it? final there, and I'm playing the clip now, the back corner of the end zone, that catch yep. with I mean, mm-hmm. 12 seconds left to play, and that place erupts. Uh, the night game there, that final, 29-22, just – mayhem out there in Montana. That was very fun to watch um, seeing those clips and those things. But again, going back to, uh, to Jane Downs, he wasn't the only one on their team to uh, pick up some of those accolades. He was named, uh, well, we in the college football network, we put out our kind of our players of the week. And uh, I will say, we picked him first. It was a very easy one. The NAIA also chose him as their National Defensive Player of the Week. But uh, they had they actually swept the Frontier Conference Player of the Week awards this week. And um, him being the first and potentially the easiest of those picks. But you talked about Landers Smith already as that offensive player spot. And then Andrew uh, almost there on the special teams side of things. And... Uh, that's pretty good. When you can sweep the conference awards, that's uh, it's a pretty good indicator of, of what you're doing well. Now, of course, that being said, how many other t- conference uh, teams played this week? You could obviously make that argument um, because you're not having yeah. like full quote-unquote participation. Uh, but when you go back and talk specifically about Jaden Browns, you said it like it's a combination of, uh, yes, obviously talent. The dude has uh, a nose for the ball, but also just right place, right time. And probably just great scheme on top of yeah. all else. I mean, three interceptions, mm-hmm. four tackles to add with that, and one of those he brought back to the house. That is a stat line. He is uh, going to be really tough to live up to that one the next couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, but hey, I, I think he'll take it either way. <laughs> yeah, so. facts. 100%. So, yeah, no, I'm excited to, to continue to follow along with them, and I guess we can just keep going right down the, the train here. Texas Wesleyan versus number 20, Lindsey Wilson. The first game for Brad Sherrod, their head coach, who we talked about actually previously on the show, I believe like almost a month or two ago. Uh, what would you see from, from this one, and, and especially his first game at the helm for them? Yeah, first of all, I got to say I got beef with the uh, the NAIA Presto Stats office with their preseason poll. <laughs> I have no – look, I understand you have a first-year head coach, but we've had the conversation about Brad that, like, this is a guy that knows what he's doing. Yeah. Um, I don't know how you leave them out of your top 25. I know for sure whenever the next poll comes out, they will be ranked, obviously. Yeah. Um, they're a really good football team. I think they're top 15 in the country right now, and they went out against a very storied, historically fantastic Lindsey Wilson team and pretty steadily – like they they got it under control it was a it was a heavyweight bout you know in the beginning that first staff was pretty back and forth second quarter they're putting up like 40 plus combined points or whatever they're doing um but man pitching a shutout against Lindsey wilson in that second half is absolutely huge if you're texas wesleyan they played a consistent game all around yeah, no, that, that was probably the biggest thing. I think, again, just looking at box score, I didn't get to watch the game um, live, but when you just glance at a box score, like what are some of the things that jump out to you? And a shutout in the second half is something that jumps off a box score, especially uh, when you go into halftime so competitive. And not to say they had an offensive explosion in the second half, but they didn't need to because the other side of the ball yeah. uh, just stepped up and did their thing. So, yeah, I mean, uh, respect 
seems like definitely earned from that uh, that Texas Wesleyan squad. And I guess people just more people going to be hit moving forward. I guess to what they got going on down there. Yeah, I think we need to mention too Texas Wesleyan getting back to back pick sixes, uh, yeah. back to back drives, not back to back plays. But my goodness, that's a that's a backbreaker. Lindsey Wilson subbed out Reed at Brickley pretty quickly after that. Um, also, should mention that a Shally Cannon for um, uh, excuse me, uh, Texas Wesleyan having an absolute day with fourteen total tackles and a tackle for loss. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, it's. Fun Texas Wesleyan team, man. I I know everybody's worried about the first year head coach. They're returning so many people from last year. I don't think it's going to be a problem. I think this is going to be a top fifteen team, and we'll touch on it later. But they've they've got their work cut out for them for sure. But I think if they can survive this early slate, they'll be smooth sailing for the rest of the year. Yeah, I, I would agree with you a hundred percent there. And let's keep things moving and talk about this uh, this Evangel squad going in another top 25 ranked opponent in Kansas Wesleyan. They pick up that 35, 24 win. And uh, just talk to me about your thoughts after, uh, you know, reactions to this one. Yeah. Um, I mean, this was, it was a slow start for Evangel, but once they got rolling, they really got rolling uh, the second and third quarter. They scored all of their points, a couple touchdowns in the second quarter, three in the third quarter. And that was pretty much, good enough to carry them the entire way there. Kansas Wesleyan, you know, scored points here and there sparingly, but uh, defense for Evangel just looked really dominant. And I think, too, it's worth mentioning on the offensive side of the ball for the Valor, uh, Reed Potts to Brock Lyle. I mean, that is a connection that accounted for, you know, seven catches, 157 yards, and three touchdowns um, on the day. That is just incredible. Um, I think... Potts only completed like 10 other passes for a hundred more yards <laughs> outside of outside of Lyle. So uh, yeah. obviously the, the chemistry there is good for them, but man, it was, it was a good day for Evangel. Uh, Kansas Wesleyan showed out on the ground in the backfield between Zarek Fuel and Luke Armstrong, but just couldn't get it done. And uh linebacker, Bradley My- Myers, excuse me, too, had a great day, 13 tackles, tackle for, half a tackle for loss and a pass breakup uh, to make his day even better. Just, just a well-rounded win, very similar to what we saw last year from Evangel, um, dominating defense, offense, doing enough to get it done, and looking explosive at times, which is um, exciting to see for them. Uh, Kansas Wesleyan, obviously not the loss you want to have. But their roster is probably good enough, and it's early enough in the year they'll be able to rebound. They will still be around. It's Kansas Wesleyan. No reason for them not to. So it's, uh, it's a disappointing loss, but Evangel, man, they are as good as ever. Yeah, and that's I think that's that makes a lot of sense. The point of like, yeah, it's not so much that they were bad; the other team just better, and that happens yeah. a lot in uh, in mm-hmm. football, especially when it's really good football being played. But we've got some good football uh, that will be played this coming week, and uh, let's start with a little bit of a crossover. Number eight, Bethel down in Tennessee, they play host to Division three. What has been known as Division Three powerhouse the last year or two, maybe not so much, and Mary Harden Baylor very closely removed off of a national championship, uh, missed mm-hmm. the playoffs for the first time in, man, a couple decades. Like, this is talking about a team that is really trying to to, to come back and, and be back on that national stage. Bethel playing host to them. What are we uh, expecting going into this one to see from that squad? Yeah, I don't – Bethel's in a weird situation this year. They have a lot of restructuring to do. Their team was very senior heavy last year. Yes. Um, and they they have a lot of new things going on. D3, like high tier D3 to high tier NAI is such a weird matchup yeah. because you never quite know what the comparison there is. Um, so I'm just curious mm-hmm. to see how Bethel comes out against new competition and how they can get things rolling for guys that are going to be in new positions. So I, yeah, and they picked up a win uh, in technically week zero, week one. I mean, how does that on the NAI side? Like, how does that work? Yeah, yeah. So it was week one this past week, and week zero had happened the week before. So got you. So they pick up a win over Point, which is team we talked about a little bit. Obviously, one that deserves some respect is obviously wasn't a cakewalk for them. Twenty to six, they pick up that win. And I think the biggest note for me is is someone we've talked about uh, at least and posted about just because his stat lines have been crazy is uh, Joaquin Colazzo the third there at quarterback for Bethel. And not seeing his name on the box score makes me assume that and not on the roster. He's out of there. Do we know uh, where he ended up? I didn't have it. I guess. 
us enough time to do the research, but uh, that is yeah. a lot of production that they are losing at the quarterback position. When you look at uh, his career stats under center, the dude threw for over 3,500 yards last year and 37 touchdowns. That is tough to replace. Yeah, it's it's really tough to replace because he was absolutely fantastic for them. He was the heart and soul of that offense in the past couple of years for them. Um, and I don't know if he transferred out. I am just pretty sure that he's just not on the team. He either graduated or is just done. So interesting. Yeah, because I thought he was like listed as a as a junior. And, and we know better than probably anyone that like finding information for small school football sometimes can literally be yeah. like pulling <laughs> teeth. Yes. You so. might be better off going to your local public library and trying to find <laughs> newspaper clippings. Yeah. At certain That's points. 100% but, uh, true. So can't confirm, definitely, but definitely yeah, excited for roster. that, though. That, that matchup's going to be good. Uh, I'm excited about the offensive backfield for the Mary Harden Baylor squad to see what they do uh, offensively. And, and then the, obviously the defense has to step up. But that's one area I think I'm looking for uh, from the Knights there. And if they can pull off a win like that, um, it won't necessarily count for them in the D3, you know, kind of landscape of things, the way the playoffs are structured and then kind of how they how they rank things. But it is what it is. Let's talk about that Montana Tech squad again over at Carroll. What are you looking to see from this one? And I think, you know, pulling up the history here of their matchups between the uh, uh, those two squads, if it'll load up here. Carroll's got a really good record in this one. 59 wins, 18 losses, and two ties in the history of this matchup. Now, last year, though, Ordiggers took it 23-17. Can they mm -hmm. keep it going and uh, build off that one? Yeah, I mean, Carroll is an AIA royalty. They have spent a lot of time playing winning football, winning championships. Um, I'm kind of surprised the rivalry is that lopsided, but Montana yeah. Tech has had a lot more valleys than Carroll's program historically, so I I could see how that's the case. Um, but, man, Montana Tech coming off an emotional win. you got to go on the road to hostile territory against the Carroll team that feels like they are not where they need to be right now um, as a team that is not in the top ten currently. So it is really curious to see how Montana Tech is going to respond. You know, the week after an emotional win can sometimes be difficult. We see that all the time in football. And Carroll's not a team that's going to care. They're going to have no sympathy. They don't like each other. I mean, this is a big rivalry game. Um, and it already means a lot in the frontier. But beginning of the season, we're already starting conference play. It seems like every game in the frontier matters for something because yep. they just beat the crap out of each other. But I'm really curious to see how Montana Tech responds to last week. Um, yeah, should be a good one. It will, and it'll probably be one on the ground. I mean, Carroll's not a team that we saw a ton of offensive firepower from last year when it comes to, like, blowing out opponents. Uh, they won a lot of quality football games, but the margin of victory maybe is something that they weren't incredibly known for. I mean, just over 23 points per game last year, and you're still 7-3, and 5-3 mm -hmm. and three in that conference uh, is very impressive. And uh, when your rushing attack is, is certainly become the focal point for them in that physical style, I mean, we'll see what it looks like. Um, their conversion percentage on third and fourth down is not something that looks – incredibly enticing under 50 percent on, on third and then you drop down to like 35 on fourth so uh not something where if they if they get off schedule that's something that could slow them down a lot especially early on and uh, if montana tech can keep the ball away from them and play that kind of game of keep away so to speak i would yep. certainly look for that to be a big indicator of i mean any team winning if we're being honest but uh Definitely excited for that one. Let's keep it moving down. We've got uh, number three, Georgetown. Well, formerly number three. You've got to imagine they take a couple yeah. drops <laughs> down in the poll. Uh, but uh, they're at a squad that's receiving votes in Pikeville. And, uh, you know, the first time I had the note there, the first time Georgetown has lost their home opener since 2019. And I, I will also note, no, no discredit to some of those other squads, probably the toughest opponent, easily the toughest opponent they've had in their home opener in that time span. So uh, not to be a stat that's, you know, you're not gaping. It's too crazy of a stat. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but Pikeville, man, this is kind of an interesting team. Both these teams are coming off pretty decent losses. I forget who Pike, you Pike just played, but I know they lost their previous game. Um, but man, this is Pikeville's kind of that sneaky team, um, in the conference that we weren't quite prepared for last year. Very curious to see how they play a kind of battered Georgetown team that frankly is probably pretty pissed off that they have yeah. a loss on their record right now. 
So um, should be a good one. I imagine that there's going to be emotions flying, but Pikeville, man, they're they're a team to watch out for. Um, they have some good momentum rolling. So, and in the history of this one too, when you look at uh, that. This one very lopsided as well. Pike has only taken two of the 17 matchups. 35-14 was the matchup in September of last year for Georgetown. I mean, I guess we're not technically going through and making game picks. I would certainly say it's safe to assume that it'll be a, a similar score, but you never know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you never really know. That's that's the fun part about a lot of these games this early in the year. So. Yep. Absolutely. And then we'll uh, close it off. We've got uh, a couple more matchups to talk about here, and we'll kind of quickly go through these ones. Number 10, Morningside, trying to bounce back at Concordia. They're uh, Concordia coming off a 45-7 win over Waldorf. Now, again, no discredit to Waldorf. Not really a huge shocker or surprise there. Uh, I mean, expect this to be a really big bounce back game for Morningside in short. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think Concordia is worth mentioning here because yep. they're a team that I was high on in the preseason because they're – Every few years, they cycle through enough guys to where they have a lot of returners and their defense looks horrifying. They're in that spot currently. So I am like, this is borderline top 25 Concordia here. So could have some implications if Concordia can do the impossible. Yep. And then you go down and a Texas Wesleyan team that uh, we're assuming will probably be in that poll uh, in the coming week. Going down, take on number 16, man. This will be an exciting one. Talk to me about uh, what you see there. Yeah, going to be an exciting offensive game. Uh, Ottawa, Arizona, known very often for their high-powered offense. Um, their defense is going to be in a decent spot, too, this year. But, man, this is, like, this is playoff implication. This is conference championship. Like, in week two, we are already here for the Sooner. Um, they're hosted it real early, and I'm excited to see how it goes because uh, Ottawa is a good football team in Texas Wesleyan. I think this will probably determine the conference. So, it's... Uh, Definitely worth watching. Should definitely put it on one of your monitors, but I like it. Be paying like attention it. to what happens and take note because that's that's one that's gonna have big implications going down the road. And then another Ottawa squad out of Kansas. They're at number twenty four. Friends, who uh, I know I've became a fan of them last year based on their offense and the way they play ball down there, uh, the Falcons. But what do you what do you see there? Yeah, Friends is bringing back a lot of alignmen. They are still pounding the rock. They're still a very good football team. Ottawa, Kansas in an interesting spot because they squeaked into the playoff last year, pretty much on the stipulation of there being two different divisions in the KCAC that they went like six yep. and five. Um, so they're receiving votes. They're in an interesting spot, though. I don't know how long they're going to be there, but there's still something to be said for winning your side of the conference. So for now, I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt and small sample size from this year. So I think that'll be a decent game. And honestly, with friends, if that offense isn't, going a hundred percent or you know they're not operating at what we've seen them operate at before it's going to be a very slow very low scoring game which can yeah. be anybody's so absolutely and we'll finish off with a really good one number 22 louisiana christian at number 12 st thomas and from what i saw this is the first ever meeting between these two squads and it just so happens to come when both of them are top 25 nationally recognized programs at the time being now also worth noting neither team gets film on the other from week one i guess so far because they just haven't had contests yet so that's something uh definitely worth noting i think there's there's a couple of these on the list where the other teams already got film on their opponent where it doesn't work vice versa so that's definitely worth noting i think some of the biggest points for me looking at the some of the returners and I mean, some of the uh, departures from both of these squads Louisiana Christian losing their top rusher and Devin Briscoe who was a thousand yard plus uh, production piece last year they're starting quarterback Sam Pal uh, Palermo excuse me he's also out of town I believe graduated and moved on Rontavius Farmer who we've posted about and talked about a little bit for St. Thomas is back 1800 plus yards in 2023 they do lose two of their three top pass catchers so Moving pieces all across the board. Still two teams that have been given national respect. Who has the mm -hmm. edge going into this one? I got to think it's St. Thomas. Louisiana Christian right now is at a bypass where they also had a lot of seniors last year. Um, last year was the culmination of the past couple of years that program has been putting in to itself. Um, and they it obviously paid off for them, made it to the playoffs, had a fantastic year. But they're starting to feel some of the repercussions of that now. Not entirely sure where their heads are at or their rosters at with everything they got going on from the offseason. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see who 
you know, who's going to step up for this team? Because at the end of the day for Louisiana Christian, that's what has to happen. Your young guys have to come through. St. Thomas definitely has the edge. Rontavious Farmer is absolutely ridiculous. Stug. Every time I talk about him, he's doing no. something crazy. So excited to watch him. But obviously, it's going to be easy to key in on him, too, when you don't have a lot of receiving talent coming back. So Yeah, I hear you. I'm excited mm-hmm. for all of it. Thank you once again for joining me, brother. It's great to have you back and, and provide your insight. Knower mm-hmm. of ball right there. Yes. Did you wanna did you wanna finish out on that stat line there? I see you got that up. Dude, there. I'm I'm highlighting the stat line. I need I need everybody to lock in here for a second. Okay. <laughs> so Gerald Monroe from Graceland. This is a guy last year that was third on his team in receiving after playing like four games the entire season and got hurt or had uh, I forget what happened, but he didn't play that much last year third on the team in receiving yards after playing four games just like ridiculous stuff right so we expected a big year from him this year comes out decides to catch 17 passes for 387 yards and five touchdowns uh tet mcmillan eat your heart out you had a fantastic game brother but this is this is different yeah. it is different out here in hell, yeah, Island. It is. hell yeah it is yeah thank you very much matt i appreciate you man great to have you back have a good rest of your night brother Yeah, you too, man. Take it easy. See ya.